Today, churches around the world are celebrating Transfiguration Sunday. We mark the end of the season of Epiphany and prepare for the season of Lent, which officially begins this week with Ash Wednesday. Transfiguration is all about change. There is an apocryphal story from seminary about a young seminarian who thought that he, excuse me, they, would impress their New Testament professor by comparing the transfiguration to a transformer. Not a transformer as in a component that transfers electrical energy from one circuit to another. No, this young and handsome seminarian was talking about the transformer toy, cartoon, movie. For those of you worshiping online, you can quickly Google what a transformer is and you can probably guess how badly it will go. I think the professor might be uh, playing tricks on me or whoever, whoever the seminarian was, excuse me. <laughs> professor, just like Jesus changed his form, a transformer can change from a robot into a truck. It can change from a robot to a jet. It can change from a robot to a helicopter. And it was at this moment the professor in a very loud voice responded, and it can change your grade from an A to an F. <laughs> Needless to say, the young and handsome seminarian was silent the rest of the class and for the rest of the semester. The point the professor made, and it was a good one, was that the change that occurred on that mountaintop not only happened to Jesus, but to the disciples as well. The change that started on the mountaintop continues in us today. The first eight chapters of Mark are full of stories of Jesus healing the sick, loving the unlovable, forgiving the unforgiven, and challenging the church authority. Also from the beginning, the disciples are along for the ride. They are witnesses to every amazing thing that Jesus is doing. They cannot help but believe that this Jesus is the one that God had promised long time ago. The one that would lead the Jewish people in a revolt against the Roman Empire and to regain their rightful place of power in the world. But then in chapter 8, Jesus tells the disciples that he is going to head to Jerusalem and die. The disciples are shocked. Their hopes and plans appear to be crushed. That is the context for our gospel today. After that reveal, Jesus and his closest disciples head to a mountain. A couple of things to keep in mind to make sure that you, us, today's readers and listeners, know that what is happening in our gospel is a significant event. First, this trip to the mountain happens six days after chapter 8. The Gospel of Mark is famous for being filled with things that happen immediately. Jesus heals and immediately he's in another town doing something amazing. I had to chuckle because of the typo in our gospel. It said the gospel is from Mark 2, which would have been a phenomenal feat for everything would have happened in chapter 1. But that would have been fitting for Mark with everything immediately. But really, this happens in Mark chapter 9. So we go from Mark talking about everything happening immediately to six days later. A time gap. A rare moment to breathe in Mark's gospel. Next, we have Jesus going to the mountain with his three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John. 
Throughout Mark's gospel, it is Jesus' inclination to have these three disciples with him at moments of special revelatory significance. The raising of Jairus' daughter, when Jesus explains the destruction of the temple later on in chapter 13, and when Jesus prays in Gethsemane in chapter 14 and in today's gospel. The significant event the three disciples witness is the transfiguration. This is where the change not only occurs to Jesus, but to the disciples as well. Back then, it was a common, widespread religious belief that gods and spirits could transform themselves into earthly beings to demonstrate their power on others and to draw humans to them. There was an apocalyptic belief, including among Jewish circles, that the transformation was reverse, from human to God or deity. The Jewish people believed this transformation was a gift they would receive after resurrection. There is the key word, after. When Jesus is transfigured, transformed, it is not at the end of life. It is not at the resurrection. It is happening at that very moment. In real time, in the real world. That makes Jesus' transformation unique. And then Moses and Elijah show up. It's like being at party with the best cake, and guess what? You get cookies along with it. They both show up. Moses, the supreme lawgiver of Israel. Elijah, the first and greatest of Israel's prophets. For the disciples looking at this, no two people were more important in the story of God and Israel. And Moses and Elijah had some things in common with Jesus. Elijah was a model for the suffering of God's servant at the hands of the ungodly. Moses, for all his qualities of leadership, found himself repeatedly rejected by the people. And it was on a mountain that both Moses and Elijah met with God and heard God's voice. And now they were talking to Jesus. What did they talk about? Mark does not tell us. Luke says they were speaking about Jesus' departure. For Mark, the point is not what they said to each other, but that Jesus is talking to these two heroes of faith. In the eyes of the disciples, that meant Jesus, their rabbi, is on the same level as Moses and Elijah. Wait a minute. They are talking to my rabbi. But the appearance of Moses and Elijah also held a special place in the hearts of the Jewish people. Elijah and Moses were considered the undead ones. The Jewish people believed that Moses and Elijah did not die as much as they were taken away by God. So they could show up at any time. And when they did, they were the signs that the whole universe was to, about to enter that undead, that eternal state. It meant something good was coming. Make that someone. So think about the context again. These three disciples, after just hearing the news that Jesus, their rabbi, their leader is going to die and wondering what the future holds for them. Now they see that the future is not going to end with Jesus' death, but with new life. Another way to think of it, best mountaintop experience ever. Several early Jewish and Christian traditions locate paradise itself on a mountain. 
So I think we can understand Peter's longing to stay in this paradise. It's a very human desire to hold on, to breathe in every single second of a grand moment because those kinds of moments are too fleeting. But the thing about the experience that Peter and the others witness is that it can't stay on the mountain. Just as Peter offers to make dwellings or tents for all of them, God speaks. This is the same God we hear in Mark chapter 1 at Jesus' baptism. Then, just like in chapter 9, this is God the Father, not God the Creator, the God who tore open the heavens to see His own Son being baptized. Now God proclaims His love for His Son again, and God also gives a command, a commandment to the disciples. Listen. Listen to Jesus. To talk with Jesus. To have conversation with Jesus. In other words, come down from the mountain and have a relationship with Jesus. Don't just follow Jesus. Love Jesus. Open your hearts and be transformed. I believe that is what happens on the mountaintop. Yes, Jesus changes his appearance, but so do the disciples. They become more than students. They become witnesses. They become the ones who will later on share what happened on the mountain. And the story is so important, so vital in the story of Christianity that it becomes a part of three Gospels. Peter, James, and John also become Jesus' companions. Because as they leave the mountain, Jesus goes with them. Jesus did not go away with Moses and Elijah. Jesus goes with them back to the other disciples, back to, back to the real world, if you will. And now, this is the world we live in. And the same Jesus is with us, walking with us, being our constant companion, and asking us to listen to converse, to follow, and to love him. For us, coming down from the mountain is to come out from these church walls and to take what we have seen, what we have witnessed, and share it with others. We share it with words and actions. We share it with love. We share it with grace, with no questions, with no catches just with honesty. Transfigured in the Bible does mean to change in a manner visible to others, like Jesus does in our gospel, but it has another meaning that St. Paul made famous, to change inwardly in fundamental character or condition. When you follow Jesus with all your heart, you cannot help but be changed changed for the better. Transfiguration is all about change, and it is a change for the better. Thanks be to God. Amen.